AI is a powerful tool. summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values. Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Good day, everyone. Uh, we are very excited today to have a new session of the AI for Good Discovery Series on AI for Biodiversity. This series represents a partnership between the International Telecommunication Union, the, Conver the Convention on Biological Diversity, NatureServe, and the Alexander von Humboldt Institute of Colombia. Maria, can you hear me? Are you there? Your screen seems to have frozen. Okay, I think we've lost Maria. Jorge, perhaps you want to Go ahead. Okay, she's jumped off the call. Hopefully, she'll be joining us again in a minute. Here we go. I'm back. Hi, Hi Maria. Welcome back. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, the the AI for biodiversity series is very important because the same team sustainable development goals are very interconnected with biodiversity. We could, we cannot achieve our goals if we cannot maintain and restore biodiversity. A degraded biosphere has consequences that go far beyond conservation issues and hit at the heart of human health and well-being. So we hope, we hope that this series not only inspires you and celebrate that many achievements and, and innovations by our wonderful speakers, but also serve as a platform to accelerate the sharing and upscaling of creative solutions and ideas. And of course, we welcome all of you to join online from around the world via AI for Good Neural Network Platform. Welcome to today's session. So today's session is dedicated to the use of AI to support biodiversity conservation through world wildlife monitoring. 
Camera traps have been a crucial tool in the study of wildlife populations and assessment of conservation outcomes. They are used to assess species research, population trends, and monitor biodiversity in protected areas, corridors, indigenous, indigenous lands, and other conservation lands. However, the processing of thousands of images generated by these cameras is a challenge. To address this issue, various organizations have partnered to create Wildlife Insight, a cloud-based platform that enables conservations and researchers to, to efficiently manage, analyze, and share their wildlife data, supporting a variety of conservation efforts, such as monitoring and protecting endangered species and habitat and ecosystem management. Wildlife Insights uses advanced technology to process and analyze large amounts of wildlife data collected from camera traps, providing tools for data visualization and collaboration, allowing, allowing users to share their data with colleagues and stakeholders around the world. The platform is open source and freely available to anyone who wants to use it for conservation efforts. Wildlife Insights leverage the power of AI for biodiversity conservation. So with that, we are incredibly excited to introduce our two speakers for today. Jorge Almada is a senior wildlife conservation scientist with Conservation International's Betty and Gordon Moore Center for Science. He's interested in applying mathematical models to solve applied conservation problems through projects that vary from studying the impact of climate change on diseases and biodiversity to incorporating the effects of temperature and rainfall on models of disease transmitting carriers. He also champions the use of camera traps on the wildlife picture index as tools to monitor protected area efficient effectiveness and ecosystem health in his previous work as the executive director of the Tropical Ecology Assessment and Monitoring Team Network. The other speaker is Tomer Gadot. Tomer Gadot is a leader in Google's Enterprise AI group, I group, where his team of data scientists and engineers develop innovative machine learning solutions for complex enterprise problems. Passionate about the use of AI for conservation, Tomer also leads the Google AI team who develop computer vision algorithm for wildlife insights, a cloud-based platform that helps conservation monitors and protect wildlife. Prior to this, Tomer spearheaded efforts to advance the quality of experimentation and instrumentation in Google search largest verticals, resulting in improving search results for billions of users. So with these two amazing um, speakers, we will start our session today. The floor is yours, Jorge. Thank you, Maria, Maria Cecilia. Thank you for the introduction and good morning, uh, everyone. Good, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. Really happy to share uh, Tomer and I today um, some ideas of how um, we partner together to try to solve this issue of processing large amounts of data coming from camera traps. Um, I would I want to I want to say that this is an effort of uh, of several organizations that have partnered together to cr create this platform, including Conservation International, the Wildlife Conservation Society, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, the Smithsonian, WWF, uh, Yale's Map of Life and the Zoological Society of London. And of course, with the technical support uh, leadership of Google. So we want to talk about today specifically the AI side of, of, of this platform and how AI is, is, is one of the key crucial components of, of solving this problem. Um, can I have the next one, please? Thank you. So the problem that we're facing as we're as we're looking at achieving, you know, sustainable development goal 15, life of land, ensuring the preservation of life of land, is what li what wildlife or what animals live here or live in a, in an in any particular area on the globe and you know unlike forests that you can see from space most animals are not seen from space uh, at least yet or only large ones so we have no way or you know until recently we had no way to really verify 
the species composition of, of uh, areas like this that are forested or even open areas that have a lot of different fauna. Um, so we really need eyes in the forest and this is what camera traps really help us with. Camera traps are these devices that is started becoming very common in beginning of the century, um, but really took off in, I would say 2007, 2008, when they became digital and their costs went down. They're minimally invasive. They basically sit there taking pictures of animals that come by. Uh, they collect this very important information, which is about animals is not just the presence of an animal, but also helps us estimate the absence of that animal from an area. Um, this is this is very important information to have in order to model this distributions of species over space and understand trends, because most methods that we use currently only record the presence and not the absence. Cameras, because of the nature of being there, re sampling repeatedly over time, allow us to calculate the probability of absence, which is uh, a very a very important um, component of this. They allow us to do spatial and temporal replication. You can take these things and put the, put 100 cameras over a large area, and you can leave them there for a few months and then do it again. So you can establish a really easy, solid, and robust monitoring program. Um, they don't have uh, any time that they work or not. They can work 24 hours sampling large numbers of species, nocturnal species that are that are most, also, most often the most difficult species to study. Uh, one nice thing is that the observations that camera traps generate are verifiable because there's an image. So anyone can come back and look at the image and decide whether this is actually the species that was identified or not. Um, presence absence I already talked about. It also allows us to calculate individual uh, use, use the images to estimate uh, differences between individuals and and assess individual recognition, which is useful for some population level indicators. And as Maria Cecilia uh, mentioned in the beginning, from all these data, you can calculate population level indicators going from occupancy, relative abundance, density, and other important ecological indicators of wildlife. Um, so it's more than images. It's a lot of other information that is important. Um, next. So I uh, talked about the presence absence part, but I want to I want to emphasize that, you know, compared to occurrence records, which are the most common uh, records we have on biodiversity, you know, like the Global Biodiversity Information Facility is full of occurrence records. Um, we have some things, some properties of camera trap data that are complementary. Um, first of all, is the sampling coverage. So camera traps can be sampling an area repeatedly over time. Um, they also have a wider taxonomic coverage because they just take a picture of anything that is in front of them. And even though the animals that they, they, um, they photograph are mostly terrestrial animals, uh, some people have started putting camera traps in the under, in the, uh, under the canopy and other places. So the taxonomic coverage is ever increasing, including many birds and arboreal mammals as well. Um, and so, and the other thing is uh, the spatial coverage. So because uh, camera traps can be deployed in any location or, or ma in many locations, you can actually target areas that are undersampled for specific species where we have no information or we have gaps. Uh, so, th so this is part of a paper that we've been working on to to basically uh, analyze the, um, the the contribution of camera trap data to global biodiversity change and global biodiversity knowledge. Um, next, here's an example from the same paper that um, that highlights this problem. So, in blue, we have well. In, so here, here's a species of, of, of rat in um, Madagascar. And in blue, we have the, the quadrants of that species that have been, where the species has been observed. So these are presence records. Uh, in green, we have, in the middle there, we have some observations from camera traps. And they actually are pretty nice fit here because they sample in a time when no presence records were observed. But they're not in the same place. So 
in the bottom here, we combine information from presence record and presence records and from camera trap records to calculate the species information index, which is an index that calculates the proportion of the range that is being sampled. And as you can see, you know, the species information index uh, is expanded with the use of camera trap data. And so we have a much more thorough analysis in the paper about how this is done, but uh, the message is essentially that you can complement the spatial distribution of species and better understand, expand their temporal coverage and better understand how they're changing over time. Uh, next. So I wanna put this slide here because I'm gonna come back to it at the end. This is a project we carry out with the Amazon Sustainable Landscapes Program, a Jeff funded initiative is looking to uh, provide tools and uh, knowledge platforms for uh, protected areas in the Amazon, indigenous communities and local communities as well. And uh, this is a project that was funded by um, uh, the United Nations Development Program, uh, looking at uh, working with some communities in Colombia that were trying to build a, a corridor to connect uh, different parks. And they were motivated by this because they wanted to be part of the management uh, program of the of these of these protected areas and, uh, and figure out some kind of solution that will, from the civil so society side of things, work. So they they proposed a corridor and they called it the jaguar corridor because this jaguar is one of those species that if it's in an ecosystem or at least in tropical forests will be a good indicator of ecosystem health. And uh, and they just put, uh, they just had uh, jaguar detections and other things, and they decided to install a series of camera traps in this jaguar corridor, to um, to test whether the the corridor was effective. So very straightforward um, uh, idea, and and it's something that would normally take months and months and months to deploy. So we we work with them using wildlife insights and using some of the tools that you'll see today. To, to speed up this process. And I'll, I'll, I'll report back on what we found at the end. Um, next. So as I mentioned, camera trap data is very good, but there's a lot of barriers on its use. Um, first of all, it, the data flow is very slow. So millions of images are collected. Data can take months or years to process. Um, the data is siloed. So even when it's processed, the data is sitting on individuals hard drives or computers. Uh, it's difficult to share this information because they're big data sets. So most of this information sits by itself and is eventually lost after a while, after individuals move to another organization or the computers fail or the hard drives fail. So that's another problem. And the last problem is that even if you are sharing your data with others, most people, uh, do not have the statistical expertise to analyze camera trap data. And it's, it's not, it's, it's kind of data set that is not uh, straightforward because of a temporal and spatial dependence. So there's no easy tools to gain insights once you have all this information. Um, there's some things that you can calculate, but you cannot take advantage of the full power of the presence absence data, the nature, the uncertainty of observations and things like that. So we outlined these, these barriers in a paper um, a few years ago. And, and that this was the motivation to, um, to create uh, Wildlife Insights. So uh, as mentioned in, my, in the beginning of the presentation, you know, we got together with all these organizations and Google, and we decided to leverage all the data that these organizations had in, in their as initial data sets to build a platform that could leverage AI, cloud technology, and uh, and uh, and big data analytics to to make sure that these data is included in the conservation conversation. Um, next, so we have a platform. You know, about nine hundred projects or so. The number of images is actually much higher than that now, um, and basically uh, pretty well distributed throughout the world with uh, lots of information in the Americas, in Europe, Africa. Uh, we would we need more information in Southeast Asia and and, and middle in the Middle East, uh, but it's a it's a platform that is growing and is actually helping people process images now. Uh, and um, next one, uh, so you can anybody who has camera trap data can upload it. They could create a project, 
Uh, here's one of the older projects of camera of all the camera projects that I used to work on uh, or work with um, in, before Wildlife Insights was created. So you can filter the images by species. Here we're only looking at images of elephants. And if you click on any of these images, you will see that there's um, there's a more detail about you know this image, where was it taken, where is it, etc. And also the identification, which is not actually not shown here because the identification was done by a person because it's older data. But but the point is that you know we've created a solution that um, now uses the power of AI, uses the power of cloud-based uh, technology, and we are creating and launching soon some of the first automated analytics. Uh, that will help people gain insights from from this data. So, um, so next in this in this talk, we're going to focus mostly on AI and how this was a very very unique and difficult problem to solve, even for AI engineers. Uh, and we're still working on it a lot, but we've made a lot of progress. So, with that, let me um, hand it over to Tomer. Thank you. Um, so, I'm going to talk about our. AI, our computer vision models, and that we're developing at Google. Um, we're a team of research scientists, uh, machine learning machine learning engineers, and program managers that um, kind of came together mostly part time. So most of the people work on it because they have a passion for the cause and see the importance of it. So spend around twenty percent of their time, but many times it's twenty percent out of let's say one hundred and fifty percent rather than out of 100, um, but I'm going to talk about kind of some of the challenges, some of the unique aspects of working specifically with Camatrop data. And I figured uh, before jumping in, we can take a look at a few images just so you can get a better understanding of what type of data we're dealing with. So in many of these images compared to other data, uh, for, compared to other image data sets, you can see that the object or the animal isn't right in the center of the image. It might be a little bit in the background. It might blend in. Um, so for those of you who tuned into the talk uh, that Scott made about iNaturalist a few weeks ago, the, the data is kind of different, where in iNaturalist, many times citizen science, people will just uh, snap a photo of an animal kind of more in the middle, maybe more in a focus zoomed in. Here, sometimes the objects are kind of small. Uh, but there are some times where the animal is right in front of them, right in front of us, like, like this kind of like a little selfie. Um, we have photos where you can see kind of large landscapes, like this one in Africa. Um, and there are others that are more in a forest area where depending on, on the contrast you have on your uh, screen right now or the brightness, you might even, it might even be hard to spot the animal. Um, so I will help you with this one. There's a squirrel over there. Here we have a monkey. Um, and in this image, we actually don't have any animal at all. Th this is uh, an an uh, image without an animal we can't, or human or any object of interest. We kind of call this a blank image. We'll talk about that. Um, and over here we have uh, deer on the right side. So as kind of discussed, the problem here is that the organizations collect millions of camera trap images, but ecologists for most research and most use case cases, they don't actually care about the actual images. What they care about is records or observations that are extracted out of those images. So they need to kind of go through the, these images, sometimes one by one, um, tag them to certain degrees and kind of uh, right to somewhere kind of what what kind of what did they see in those images and as we discussed this takes a lot of resources but also time and just makes it harder to kind of intervene in real time and um, so what we're trying to do is basically um, expedite the processing part of the of the kind of collection image collection process um, for different use cases, uh, organizations might have different requirements in terms of what data they want to collect out of those images. So what kind of metadata they want to extract and what do they want to tag. Um, for many applications like population trends, you will, probably, you will probably need information about certain species, uh, but there's some times where you want 
it, um, just kind of information about maybe uh, the high level categories. And then for more kind of, um, for some research, some types of research, you need, you need more nuanced data like that, that amount, the count of animals in the images, uh, the sex, the age, or sometimes individual ID. For wildlife insights, we are focusing on the kind of high level classification and fine grained classification. So all the way down to the species level, because that's what is used the most and kind of useful for a lot of these kind of high level population counts. So how could machine learning help expedite that review process? So we kind of are looking at two main computer vision algorithms. Um, this is a screenshot from Wildlife Insights uh, from the platform. And what we see, we have image classification that tells us what animal or what object is in the image. And we have an object detector that tells us where in the image is that object and it potentially could be multiple, uh, but kind of puts a bounding box around that, around that object. Both of these are kind of well-studied algorithms. Um, they are used in a wide variety of applications. And we're going to discuss a little bit about why, you know, what, what makes it a little bit tricky or different to use these for camera trap data specifically. So first of all, um, the cameras are fixed in one location. So like Jorge said, uh, people go to the field, they will anchor the camera trap maybe to, to a tree or something, leave, the, leave it there for months. Uh, they normally take a burst of images. So they might take anywhere between like three to 10 images at a time. There are sometimes there are some cameras that take also video. Um, and then the result is that they will, a single camera could take dozens of thousands of images. And now in, normally in machine learning, what we like to do is to have as really diverse data sets. So you want to have uh, really diverse images with different backgrounds, different environments, different lighting settings, in order to kind of help the model generalize and actually learn the visual attributes of the of the object we care about. But um, here, because they're fixed and they have the exact same background, what ends up happening is that a lot of the images look uh, relatively similar. And just making sure that the model actually learns visual attributes about the animals is a little bit harder. Another aspect is just like you saw in those example images in the start, a lot of the images are just low quality. So you might have an animal that is running and therefore is a little blurry. Uh, you might only see a part of it. Let, let's say like here on the top right, there is sometimes occlusion where you have some leaves or branches that are kind of um, are hiding the animal. And then you have some weather events like rain or snow that could also kind of interfere with what we see, as well as just like camera malfunctions where the image is kind of pretty hard to, to process. Another aspect is there are many false triggers. So because these cameras are triggered automatically by either motion or an infrared sensor, um, we have a lot of events where they falsely trigger, although there isn't any object there. So for example, if there is a change in temperature, sometimes the infrared sensor will kick in and the camera will take some photos without anything. These are the blank images we talked about. There could be some uh, grass blowing in the wind that will trigger the motion detector. The motion detector. And also, as I mentioned, because uh, the cameras might take a burst of images. So let's say a sequence of 10 images, it's possible that we will see an animal and let's say the first few images, but by the time you know, it takes the entire 10 uh, image sequence, the animal might already cross and it's not there anymore. And then we have additional blank images. Now, because this happens so much, in some cameras, it happens all the way up to 80% of the images. So this issue is kind of, is especially critical in grasslands where we have a lot of kind of grass that might be blowing. Um, it happens a little bit less in kind of forest areas, but basically because this is kind of happens um, so frequently, this is kind of the number one priority for researchers um, just to kind of filter those blank images out of the way. Um, especially given if you look at an image like this, it's kind of, 
it's kind of hard to say confidently that there isn't any animal there. So it actually takes more time to classify a blank image rather than to classify, let's say, a large elephant that is right in the middle of the photo. One more aspect is just the geospatially uh, sparsity. So because camera traps give us very rich data, but they are from small pockets of the world, um, they're, they, they're, it's still a kind of relatively large effort to go out to the field and deploy them. So we wanna we we get kind of uh, good data, but from you know we don't have everything. We don't have like it's still not uh, the entire uh, population of all wildlife in the world. And using uh, AI for camera traps is com it, it, it is not a new thing. Like many teams are trying to kind of use machine learning for their uh, for the camera trap projects. But most of those are focusing on a, a smaller regions, so maybe a small, uh, a smaller kind of uh, protected area or a region in a kind of a few country, a few kind of border, uh, bordering countries. Uh, what we're trying to do here is kind of generalize across the world. So what we want to make sure is that whenever we get photos, whenever our model learns, um, let's say about domestic sheep in one area. Let's say in California, we want to make sure that it, it actually learns how sheep look like kind of across the world. So if we have a user that uh, from Australia, they'll be able to kind of use the, it'll work well for them as well. Um, thankfully, we have uh, kind of probably the largest collection of camera shop images in the world. And therefore we get kind of, we kind of have the best we can. So I'm gonna talk about uh, kind of our computer vision solutions, our models, and kind of how we how we iterate on them. So back in 2019, uh, we created a kind of a MVP and we beta launched the platform with a, sim a simple, relatively simple image classification model. Um, it was hosted on Google Cloud, and it was trained using about nine million images across 614 classes. Um, and since we kind of launched that, we got a lot of feedback from users and understood from them what works for them and what doesn't. We learned, we learned a lot from that process. And one of the things that really stood out is that because the model was not good enough for, let's say, filtering blanks, they, the, the, kind of the, the users had to go through and review every single image anyway. So pretty much um, because our model performance wasn't good enough, the, the value, the impact wasn't, uh, wasn't there. So what we kind of understood is that it's better for us to be really good at some tasks rather than being okay at many tasks, which means that although our goal is to get down to the species level for all of the classes we have, we know that given the data we have, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna happen tomorrow. So until then, we're trying to prioritize our experiments in R&D based on the impact to the user workflow. That means that our focus, first, of, as we said, like the top priority is filtering blanks and classifying whether there is a human in the animal, a uh, human in the picture, an animal, or a blank. That kind of high-level categorization already could remove between like up to 50, 60 percent of the images. So that's our number one priority. Then. We want to address frequent species, um, for example, cattle, deer, wild boar, because they're so abundant and they are so frequent, like, like so many images uh, in, in our data sets are from those species, uh, just kind of getting them out of the way will allow researchers to have more time to actually tag the more rare classes and kind of the trickier images. And then finally, we, we still want to get to all of the other species. Um, so that how that actually was kind of um, baked into kind of our new system is a few kind of components where we actually we spent a lot of time trying to create additional components around our somewhat commodity classifier that are really tailored specifically to this problem. So one of them is the object detector, which I mentioned before we have those bounding boxes. The object detector helps kind of complement the classifier. Um, it, and it helps kind of because it was trained on different data. So sometimes the detector will catch 
animals that the classifier missed and the other way around. And also because it really helps uh, when kind of when in the review process, it really helps the, the reviewer to actually see where exactly is the animal uh, kind of speed of the, the kind of tagging. Another thing we said we did is we saw that in a lot of our training data, there is actually a lot of mistakes. So we might have images that were labeled as blank, but have an animal in them, or we have images that were labeled as an animal, but there actually isn't anything there. So um, we saw that that's really confusing our models. So we kind of created a training data a training data cleanup process where we kind of um, run additional models before we even start to kind of filter out images we think have mistakes in them. Um, another kind of category of mistakes or not mistakes, but kind of inconsistencies we had was with humans. Um, so there are many images there are a lot of classes that kind of co-occur with humans. For example, you have humans in, um, let's say, dogs or humans with horses, and there is inconsistency between organizations how to label those. Sometimes they are labeled as human, sometimes they are labeled as dog or, or horse, and you also have, let's say, a human in a vehicle, so that's a car. Um, so we kind of organize those in a more consistent way throughout our data set, and that really also improved the our performance on classifying humans. One other aspect is we saw that not all types of errors are the same. So there are some, there are some errors that are more disrupt, disruptive to the user trust in the system. So for example, we saw that when we, we got a lot of complaints uh, from users about seeing wallabies in California, and we know we only have wallabies in, in Australia. Um, so while even if visually you looked at those images and sometimes you can see, let's say maybe an image of a meat of a deer, but only like the back of a deer and like kind of a part, a small part of it that could actually look a little bit like a wallaby. Uh, just the fact that we were predicting wallabies in California was kind of really reduced the trust in the system as a whole. Um, so we added, for example, the geofence suppression that just kind of, whenever it detects that a certain animal, a certain prediction of the model should not be in that region, we kind of go up in the taxonomic tree until we find some level that should actually be in that region. So with those and a few additional components we're still working on, um, and additional data, so we got, uh, for our recent release, we had 55 million images, which after the data cleanup process, went down to 35 um, across 1500 classes, we got a much better model and much better, uh, kind of a lot better impact and kind of where that is right now is that the model kind of passed the critical bar for classifying blank animal and humans, um, which means that many of our users today are able to just accept all of the predictions without, without actually reviewing them. Um, for example, our models catch about 86% of the blank images with less than 2% error, which is pretty much in line with what we see from the kind of the amount of mistakes that human make. So it's kind of like human level um, comparing to the data sets we got. And then the, our, our models are assisting in fine grain classification. So when we're looking all the way to the species level, we saw that on some projects that were not part of the training process that we kind of held out and only for testing purposes, we saw that 67% of the animal images are predicted all the way down to the species level and 88% of those are actually correct. Um, this means that um, even today, you're able to kind of um, create workflows that really expedite the review process so for example, um, users can uh, filter for a specific species, let's say one of the frequent classes like deer or mule deer, and just kind of even look on thumbnails and kind of skim through them quickly just to see if you know, they spot any mistake. And if not, just kind of accept them. Of course, the performance could change between different projects around the world. So we always recommend kind of testing that a little bit, just reviewing and making sure that you're confident with the predictions. 
So we are constantly exploring new ways to improve our model. Uh, we have a really long list of experiments and kind of research ideas we want to try out. We basically, we prioritize those based on kind of our confidence in them, uh, what we think the complexity will be. So like how much time do we think it will take both to do the research, but also to deploy that on, on cloud and like on our actual platform. And of course, what would be the estimated impact? How much do we think it will actually speed up the review process? Um, so we have a few kind of categories of uh, ideas we're working on. For example, the temporal sequence aggregation. So like I mentioned before, the, the, the cameras take a burst of images. So let's say a sequence of maybe 10, 20, 30 images all at the same time. Um, and and some, sometimes it's really easy to identify an animal in some of the image, uh, in some of those images, while in the others, maybe you only see a part of a, like, let's say a, a tail of a deer. So what we wanna do is aggregate the results, aggregate the predictions across that entire sequence and basically infer the prediction of the easy to identify image to the other images, uh, which is kind of like how humans do the review process anyway, they kind of look at it in a sequence. Um, we have a we have additional experiments. We're looking at kind of creating smaller models that will just kind of help align our kind of base model to um, to like a specific deployment. So rather than actually being, we have this very um, generic model, global model right now, but want to look if there are ways to expedite the process to actually learning the local distribution in a certain region as well. Um, we kind of train models about two to three times a year. Uh, normally, we do that when we have a lot of new data. Um, so new data sets, new, new data sets that were uploaded to Wildlife Insights and tagged. And then when we, whenever we have kind of milestone improvements that mature out of our research process. Um, whenever we launch a model, we kind of upload some information about it to our website. Uh, we also have a lot of detail about kind of our training process and what and what is the performance um and we have this table with the that describes the training data we use so that way if you know you care about a certain species you can take a look kind of did we have any training data for that species to, to get a kind of better sense of what should you expect uh the performance will be for it um yeah, that's it. it for my part. I just wanted to mention this is like a huge team effort. It wouldn't be possible without a lot of uh, hard work from many Googlers um, that kind of, yeah, both both this team and also on other people at Google that just are kind of passionate about the cause and give us a hand every now and then. Back to you. Thank you, Tomer. So no, this is... Um... This is a great overview of what our AI model is doing now. And, and there's a lot of exciting new developments. And I just want to close the talk by talking a little bit about the impact it has had on, on some projects on the ground. I want to highlight this project, which we started working with uh, on, tw on 2019, uh, as the bushfires in Australia destroyed um, large, large uh, tracts of forest and killed billions of animals. Um, we got a, um, uh, we formed a consortium of, of organizations to look at this problem and deploy camera traps around Australia. This is basically led by WWF and look at the recovery of species across different landscapes that were burned uh, by uh, different intensities. So we're in the process now of uh, kind of consolidating all this information and trying to understand how species come back to different places in Australia. Uh, a thousand, more than a thousand camera traps were deployed and nearly three million images collected. This has saved a lot of time to people having wildlife, all this data and wildlife insights. Um, we estimate that about five times, you know, the, the, the gains in speed are around time, five times faster than any other processing methods. And we're eager to, to start um, looking at these results in more detail to um, start uh, implementing some management programs on the ground. Um, in terms of the AI, this model was really good. Uh, it, it 
Uh, here we have a breakdown of the number of images of different taxonomic levels. So for example, the first row there is um, how many images we had at this species were identified at the species level. Uh, and then how many of those were actually predicted by, were actually predicted to be uh, animal images and how many, what proportion of those were correct. So the model um, predicted about 88% of the images to be at the species level and 97% of them were correctly identified to that species. And the same with all these other levels, the genus, family, order, classes, and kingdom. So the model performed pretty well <clears throat> across all these classes, saved a lot of time to a lot of people uh, while, while working on this data. And, and finally, I want to I want to go back to the priority Jaguar corridor. So, so um, this project in, it, it took about two months, one month of putting camera traps and one month of analyzing and and uh, processing the data. And this is unprecedented in many camera trap projects because it really sped up the 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 process of that this community was trying to do. So they were able to validate the the conditions in the area that that support. Um, you know, this, this corridor as having good connectivity for Jaguars, they, <clears throat> you know, we verified through a, a dashboard tool that uh, the, the Jaguar corridor has high occupancy of Jaguars uh, uh, compared to other areas outside of the corridor. Uh, it was also really important, and this is one of the important keys of, of, wild, of camera trap data to sample many, many different taxa to confirm that most of the prey species of jaguars were also part of the corridor, uh, including other species of cats, of wild cats. And, you know, as a bonus, there was a species that had never been detected in this area, the greater grison, which came in into a camera trap. So not only were there lots of benefits in terms of figuring out how to, um, how to um, uh, evaluate uh, the fitness of this corridor, but also there were new discoveries in terms of new species seen in this place that were never seen before. So I think um, I think that's all. Oh, no, sorry, one more slide. So our vision is to, in the end, for Wildlife Insights and for, um, for the role of AI in these is to be able to have a, a much more fine-grained picture of the natural world. Um, rather than relying only on historical records and existing information that can be outdated or imprecise uh, or at the wrong scale, we wanna we envision a world where we have detailed information about many of the species that we care about that are good indicators of, um, of, um, of biodiversity int intactness and that help us measure the effectiveness of protected areas and other conservation areas, including indigenous lands and uh, and other areas. So uh, I think this is where we're trying to move with this project and recognize that camera trap data is only one of the components. There's other, many other sensor data being collected in the world now, including acoustic sensors. There's a large number of people doing eDNA analyses, collecting samples in the field. All this data is gonna contribute to this vision of a much more detailed and better understanding of the species we care about. So with that, I just want to end it and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Tomer, for for the great outline of the model. And um, and we're if you want to learn more about Wildlife Insights, you can do that at wildlifeinsights.org or you can email us at info at wildlifeinsights.org. I'm happy to take any questions, or we're we're happy to take any questions. Well, Jorge and Tomer, thank you very much for that. Um, great well presentation and great work you have been doing this is really amazing and very very useful for all the um, conservation biologists that work with this type of data and are in big trouble to analyze it so thank you for resolving that for many of us <laughs> so um we have one question for our uh, public in the neural network with um, from jacob willem um he's asking wouldn't the large amount of very similar blank images be a good fit for anomaly detection algorithms? I think this question might be for Tomer. Um, thank you for the question. Um, possibly. Um, I think 
we're looking at different, so I'm assuming the question is around um, kind of detecting those blinks and kind of filtering blinks out of the kind of separating animals and blinks. And yeah, anomaly detection could, uh, could work. We're also looking, there are some kind of techniques about uh, doing, let's say, kind of pixel difference or kind of tracking throughout the images. So kind of basically trying to uh, use the image as a sequence or kind of like a video almost. Um, yeah, I don't think we, uh, we kind of put a lot of thought into anomaly detection uh, in particular, but I'll, I'll take that as a, I'll think about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, um, Tom. So um, I was curious about what you mentioned about other experiments and ideas to improve the accuracy and efficiency of, um, of the system that you have in place. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about those new challenges you are now facing and how are you trying to, to make some experiments to solve those new challenges? Sure. Um, so generally, we kind of are, are now we're in this process of kind of trying to go down. So we are kind of in a pretty good spot, we feel, in terms of kind of those high high level categories and we're trying to kind of go down and kind of focus more on those um, on the kind of frequent classes. So we already have pretty good performance around uh, for different projects in different regions, but what we're trying to really, as I mentioned, we're trying to kind of make sure the model is good enough on some of those tasks so people can just kind of accept the predictions and kind of go from um, assisting the review to kind of all the way to kind of automating it. So what we're generally doing is we kind of select a few a few projects of kind of like proof of concept. Um, we go and we kind of generate reports for each of those projects. Uh, and those reports, we kind of have a breakdown of what was the ground truth data and what, what, what did the model predict. And then we actually kind of manually inspect those. So we both look at like high level metrics and stats to understand you know, what is the accuracy like? What is the, um, what are, what is the precision and recall for each one of those species and classes? But we also just look at the sample, let's say 100 images and just look at them and see, uh, and see what we can learn from it. And that, that really kind of helps um, navigate and prioritize kind of what, what experiments we'll look at uh, because sometimes it kind, of it kind of identifies a weak spot. So it could be, for example, we find out that may, maybe the data is a little bit messy. Uh, maybe kind of that's how we found out that uh, we have this confusion between humans and dogs and horses. Um, so that's kind of our process of kind of identifying what is the next, next big thing. Um, and now our kind of two, as, as I mentioned, like, like two of the kind of larger things we are working on are the sequence aggregation, because there are some images that no matter um, how well the, our model will be will just be impossible to classify without context about what was the image before and what was the image after. So basically, without seeing, you know, kind of a sequence of images, even a human will not be able to predict that. So we're looking at to kind of get that the same process that humans use to review those images and to kind of and help our model um, predict better. And then another kind of another. Uh, well, a few other ideas we have are like a better uh, geospatial kind of modeling, um, similar a little bit to what I, uh, um, Scott talked about in iNaturalist. Uh, so not only just to suppress the results, but also kind of get a better understanding kind of what is the distributions uh, that we expect to have. Wow, super interesting. Um, and I have then an, another question um, related to the challenge of uh, video analysis. Like you mentioned, some of the cameras were now starting to record video. Um, does uh, we expect Wildlife Insights to analyze video soon? <laughs> or are you still, uh, are you doing that already? <laughs> well, uh, so, so currently we're not doing video, but this is something that um, a lot of our users have asked for. So we're trying to find ways to implement it. One solution that many people use is to take uh, take the videos, which are normally not very long videos. Normally, the camera traps only record 30 second videos or so and uh, convert them into a series of images uh, and upload them that way. 
uh, and but we realize that's not an ideal process because you might have to do that for a lot and a lot, a lot of videos. But that's one solution some of our users have hacked uh, into to do that. Uh, so yeah, we, it's in the prospects. Uh, we don't know when we'll start looking at, into it in the next uh, couple of years to see if we can have a solution soon. But it's another big problem um, that um, that probably requires a different approach um, uh, in terms of AI is my guess. Great. We do have another question for uh, from our um, public. Um, and Nestor uh, Patricius uh, presents uh, first. Uh, he says, great presentation. Uh, is the model publicly available and could we run on the edge? E.g. wraps PI with Coral? Um, do you want to take that? Sure. I mean, currently the model is not publicly available, but there's discussions about that. Um, and I think it, it, it could be soon. Uh, we, don't we don't run on the edge yet, except that we do have a version of the model that runs on a desktop. Uh, so we have implemented an alpha desktop solution. And I believe is this is this last version of the model that um, Tomer discussed that we have running there, um, and it runs very efficiently. Um, I don't think it's too difficult to think about uh, RASPI or Coral in the near future. Actually, it's one of the very very uh, on-demand things as well to be able to run these on on, on cameras themselves, um, and then you know pass on the identifications and a low version of the a low resolution version of the image to save some space and things like that. But um, I don't know if Tomer wants to complement any of that or any other details. <clears throat> um, no, that's that's good. <laughs> Well, um, questions are coming in. So oh, we do have another um, technical um, question. Uh, Jacob Willem is uh, doing it. What data argumentation are you using? And that aid in occluded animals? Yeah, so um, uh, just a little bit of context for the less technical folks. Uh, data augmentation is a technique to kind of um, try and augment or change your data in order to kind of make it a bit more diverse. So um, kind of maybe there's some techniques, an image specifically, let's say uh, flipping the image for different angles or changing the brightness, contrast, um, those kind of things are mirroring. So that those are kind of generic data augmentation techniques that work well for, um, for kind of image class, like image problems, computer vision in general. Um, we are using specifically something, uh, a paper called RAND Augment. So that's a collection of uh, many kind of, of these kind of data augmentation techniques uh, that, are, that come together. So what happens when the model is trained, basically uh, randomly selected, there are like three or four of these kind of either like um, kind of zooming in or changing the kind of like the yeah, some, some visual aspects about the image just to kind of make it a little bit more diverse. And we're actually using a pretty aggressive one. So um, it was kind of surprising to me because uh, we kind of tried, tried a pretty aggressive kind of uh, approach here that when I'm looking at the images, I can't bear, like sometimes you cannot see any animal there, but we, we think that because, because um, as I mentioned, the, the images are taken from one, let's say, the images that are taken from a single uh, camera are very similar. So actually adding very aggressive kind of transformations and augmentations is kind of really helps in order to make it a little bit more diverse and just to uh, help the model generalize better and not kind of memorize what the background looks like and like what, what certain trees in the area look like. Um, so that's, that's been really useful. Great. Thank you for, for your answer. Um, so there is one more question about the like technical thing. So um, Juan Sebastian Cañas um, first says amazing work. Um, now the question is, in the development stage of the algorithm in the wild, how to include the uncertainty of the model to inform biologists that the models are not sure about the results? For example, in the case of 
domain chief? That's a great question, and it's a it's a challenge. Um, one of the things uh, we learned as well is just uh, expectation setting and it be able to being able to kind of communicate better what does the model do um, really helps. Um, I mean, it, it's a challenge in, in general because people expect sometimes magic. They would want a perfect model that will always get the right answers, but that you know does not exist uh, in this field in machine learning in general. Um, so some of the things we tried to do here is, first of all, we create a lot of, we, we create, we really look carefully on the thresholds the model uses to, in order to kind of say something. So basically we try, we try to kind of, um, only make predictions when the mo model is very confident about them. And we also surface the confidence score to the users. We also created a category, um, that I know a lot of users don't like, but basically it means no computer vision results. Um, uh, whenever the model is not confident about uh, enough, um, even if we have a pretty good guess and we're most likely correct, sometimes we will prefer not to say anything rather than saying a mistake. And the main reason is to allow them to actually automate the process. So in order for them to trust when we do say something confidently, we prefer to kind of leave maybe um, some, pro some proportion of the data, some portion of the data that we will not actually make predictions on. Um, so, so basically, we, it's a combination of documenting and explaining what data was the model trained on. For example, like, like that table I mentioned, if you see that we did not train on your species, then your expectations should be a little bit, I mean, obviously lower. Um, and then showing those model scores and trying to kind of, um, yeah, show, the, the, show our model confidence in a little bit of, in, the, in that context. And um, in that context, I was um, wondering if um, if uh, wildlife insights can be like kind of personalized to the user's needs depending on their um, project um, objectives. What are like that functionalities of uh, wildlife insight that can be really personalized from uh, the user side? Yeah, it's something we're thinking about um, in terms of specifically about and kind of the thresholds. So we know some users care about a particular species, or sometimes they would prefer to get, you know, even more, maybe their, their tolerance for mistakes is kind of higher and they would want to tune the threshold a little bit. So that's something we thought about in the past to kind of integrate into the platform just to allow users to customize the experience a little bit more. Um, we haven't got to it yet, but um, potentially. Or do you want to complement that answer, uh, like the functionalities of personalizing? No. No, um, I think, no. Okay, and then um, I was wondering. Well, given that all these passive sensors for monitoring are in a big uh, boom, and there are many projects around, you know, this this kind of processing, analyzing this type of data. Um, I wanted to to complement the question of Juan Sebastián that he, he's uh, asking uh, if there are any plans to integrate camera traps and acoustic data with like what are the plans to uh, integrate or make more interoperable, interoperable wildlife insights with other initiatives that are also working on this arena? Yeah, so um, in terms of other data types, you know, there's several levels of, for the question, you know, one level is actually doing it in the field. And I know many projects are now trying to do this. Um, so putting together camera traps and putting together acoustic sensors in the same project, uh, sometimes using the same or similar hardware for both. Um, and that's certainly something that people are interested in, but now most people have to go for a different solution for their acoustic data than for their camera trap data. And I think that uh, you know our goal is still focused pretty much on images right now and on solving this problem because it is a very, very, very big problem <laughs> uh, rather than to try to start um, trying to solve another problem uh, before solving the first one. So yes, maybe in the future, you know we can there's a, there's several actually several organizations and other initiatives working on acoustic data. The models of acoustic data for birds are becoming really, really, really good these days. Um, and um, and what we're lacking in the acoustic data realm is more the kinds of platforms that allow people to 
submit their data, share it, and those kinds of things. Cam the, the camera trap data platform that we have is, is could be adapted easily to accept acoustic records because what the only thing that changes is uh, rather than the record being an image is the identification of a sound um, in a file. And, um, and uh, as, as many people recognize, the acu acoustic data are also a form of image data. So you can represent sounds in space, uh, in, in two-dimensional space, and try to apply AI models to those. But we're not that at, we're not yet at that level of integration with other with other platforms. Um, however, we're developing some analytics and some other you know kind of API-based um, interoperability to be able to exchange some data. So if people want to submit records that are not camera trap data in the future, they could submit them to the platform and then get some of the benefits of the analysis and management without the actual you know, image data there. Um, there's many different approaches to this problem. You know, the, you could have like the specialist on image, image data or video data, and you can have the specialist on camera on acoustic data and eDNA data. And then have all those talk to each other through APIs. You know that's kind of a federated approach, where people can exchange information between different platforms without everything having to be in the same platform. But we need to agree on standards. We need to get, uh, you know, we need to get funding for those kinds of initiatives. And in all of these, it's really important that we always find a, an, uh, you know, a repository that is um, kind of the ultimate repository of all these data. You know, and, and such repositories already exist, like GBIF. You know, GBIF has a, an, an amazing um, amount of information on biodiversity, and there's a, a strong desire to integrate it with, with integrate camera trap data in, in its purest form into GBIF, and we're working on that. The same would have to happen with acoustic data, eDNA data, and others. So anyway, kind of a very long answer <laughs> to a very complicated problem, but. Well, not just um thank you very much. I just wanted to to close with some of your um thoughts about um how do you imagine, you know, wildlife insights I know in 20 years. Um how can, you know, AI really potential um these new tools of passive passive monitoring uh, and um how do you imagine this future uh we are now in the future about this really future uh, of all this passive uh, monitoring for biodiversity? Yeah, I would like to answer. And then I would also like Tomer to answer in terms of how he envisions the model uh, working in 20 years. But my answer in general is that in 20 years, we envision a world where all these data is being used and is being, and we have used it and succeeded in recovering species, in decreasing the threats for those species. And in ensuring that we are managing, um, you know, protected areas and biodiversity in a, in a way that is uh, compatible with good data and good practices, um, more than accumulating images or having billions of images, because I think by in twenty years we will have billions. It's more about the impact of that of all that information in improving our world, and so. I would expect to see lots of graphs where biodiversity was going down. And then after a while, people start realizing what was happening and then it started going to go up or stabilizing. Um, those kinds of impact level um, management results that we all want to see beyond all the things that need to happen technically to make that happen, which is what we're talking about today. But um... oh, what do you think? Yeah, that's a that's a hard question, but uh, I'm I mean, hopefully, um, I mean, in terms of the technology, I think everything will advance uh, significantly, and you know, things like running on the edge, and rather than actually, obviously, like having to send it back, and more connectivity. That I think those things will be much easier. Uh, but but yeah, I think uh, hopefully the impact. You know, we'll, we'll already have these protected areas that we may not even have to look, uh, you know, um, monitor so frequently because we'll leave enough space for it just kind of uh, the wild to, to kind of be kept wild. Well, 
thank you very much once again thank you for well this great work you have been doing and the presentation of today and thank you to um all the participants um were um, also in the neural network um uh, chat uh we invite you to stay tuned uh for uh interacting with um with Jorge and Tomer um, a little bit more. And uh, well, thank you and see you in the next AE for Biodiversity uh, session. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good. AI is a powerful tool. summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.
Thank you. 